Hi, my name is Jake Embry from the University of New South Wales. Uh, the talk I'll be giving today is titled, Do You Want to Know a Secret? The Role of Valence and Delay in Early Information Preference. It's based on some work which myself, Jian, Danny and Ben have done in 2019, as well as at the start of this year. So I'll get started. Classic information theory is relatively intuitive. It posits that we seek information that we can use to improve our experiences in the world. So you might study formula before a maths exam to get a better grade, read policies to inform your vote, or read some expert reviews before buying a new laptop. So if we can't use information, then why would we care if we obtain it or not? These, however, aren't the only times we actually seek information. In fact, we often seek information which has no obvious or immediate use. For instance, have you ever checked an email for grammatical errors after you've already sent it? The information you get from doing so, whether the grammar in it was perfect or not, isn't of great use since the email has already been sent. But the examples like this and plenty of others, um, humans do actually seek this type of information. So there are two accounts of what is known as non-instrumental information seeking, which is what we just discussed with the email example. Uh, in the literature, there's many variants of these, but they can broadly be summarized into the two. The first we're going to discuss is the anticipation account. So this account argues that people derive utility from anticipating future events. Think looking forward to the idea of going on a holiday and taking some time off work. But it isn't always necessarily good events in the future. There is also the dread of future events, like knowing you've run a red light and waiting for the fine to come in the mail. Another interesting aspect of this account is the inclusion of a temporal discounting factor. Like people discount real de delayed rewards, like such as money, according to this account, people's desire for knowledge of these delayed rewards also decreases when the delay is very far in the future. The second explanation we're going to talk about today is what we've called the uncertainty aversion account. So put simply, this account posits that people um, <coughs> are averse to uncertainty. Therefore, they will seek information which reduces that uncertainty, regardless of what they expect. So whether it's news about an upcoming holiday or news about a potential red light fine, people are going to seek information about the future, regardless of what they expect to happen. So while there are clear theoretical differences between the two accounts, they also make uh, quite distinct predictions depending on the circumstances at hand. So, and the main two things which they differ on is when it comes to valence, so positive and negative, and delay. Valence, the anticipation account predicts information seeking when the expected outcome is positive, and it predicts information avoidance when the expected outcome is negative. The uncertainty aversion explanation, however, predicts information seeking regardless of valence. People just want to reduce their uncertainty about the future, and they don't care whether this is positive or negative. The account also differs when there's a long time delay between seeking information and the actual event. The anticipation account predicts information seeking and avoidance to attenuate, so go back towards a difference at the 0.5 level uh, at very long delays, which you can see in this diagram here. Whereas the uncertainty uh, account predicts no such change. People will just continue seeking information regardless of how long it is and whether they expect it to be positive or negative news. So to test these two accounts against one another, we use what's referred to as a secrets task. So in this task, people either won points, they lost points, or they received zero points. And these points were equal to actual money they were paid at the end of the experiment. We split these trials into two blocks. So in one of them, with the win block or the win trials, people either won 100 points or they got zero points. And these occurred 50% of the time uh, either way. And in lost trials, either lost 100 points or they got zero points. The other variable at play is the delay length. So it was a delay between their initial choice, between finding out now and keeping it secret, and when they actually receive the outcome on the screen. These delays range from one second up to 80 seconds. And you can see in the diagram here, these delay lengths. So 1, 2, 5, 10, 20, 40, and 80 seconds. And participants experienced 10 of each of these. So on each trial, participants were able to choose between find out now and keep it secret. So when they chose find out now, they received a cue which told them about the outcome, which they would receive after the delay. So if it was going to be a good outcome, they received the smiley face, and then they received either uh, the better outcome. When they received a sad face, this meant they were going to receive the worst outcome after the delay. 
When they chose keep it secret, however, they received no early information. They received a confused face regardless of what was coming after the delay. To make this a little clearer, we'll run through a mock trial where a participant chooses find out now in the win block with a delay of 10 seconds. So imagine here that you're choosing between find out now and keep it secret, and you choose the find out now button. Then you receive a happy face straight away. What this means is in 10 seconds time, you're going to receive 100 points as we're in the win block and you know that there is a 10 second delay. And then after 10 seconds, the outcome appears on the screen. Boom, and you've won 100 points. And I'll just let you all take another look at the uh, schematic again here, just to get an understanding of what the different blocks were like and the different outcomes depending on the cues and what option you chose, either find out now or keep it secret. So moving on to the results, in both conditions, those being the win block and the loss block, participants showed an above average preference for find out now. That is, they preferred information about a delayed outcome rather than remain ignorant for both the win and the loss trials. There was, however, no effective delay length. So participants on average showed the same information preference, uh, the same preference for information, regardless of the delay length, whether it was one second all the way up to 80 seconds, there was no significant difference. There were, however, significant individual differences, but, this, um, but there was a correlation between the win and loss trials within subjects, and this was significant. This suggested that the same factors are at play for both positive and negative events. So moving on to the second experiment, we only made one simple change. This change was from secondary to primary reinforcers. So while money is an incentive, participants cannot consume it immediately upon arrival. They might be able to buy something with it after, but it isn't inherently rewarding. So primary rewards, however, are consumed or theorized to be consumed as soon as they arrive. This immediate consumption may influence the way people anticipate the arrival of the actual outcome. So in these two tasks here, we use M&Ms, so a chocolate, and we also use sound, and that sound was microphone feedback, so a high-pitched screeching sound, which people reported as being um, incredibly negative. These two conditions were not run uh, within participants like the previous experiment due to different programs and setups, but every other aspect of the task remained the same to experiment one. So yeah, everything was the same, just apart from this change of what the actual reward or the negative event was. So moving on to the results. Similar to experiment one, we found no difference, um, no difference between valence. So that is whether it was information about chocolate coming up or information about this aversive sound. At longer delays, people wanted to know what was coming. We did, however, find strong evidence of a delay effect this time. So whereas in experiment one, we found the same preference across delays, here we found a strong difference. Uh, that being that participants on average were indifferent at short delays. So you can see it's sort of one to five seconds. There was no information preference. People were sort of indifferent as to whether they were finding out about a delayed outcome or um, keeping it a secret. When, however, you look at delays of longer than 20 seconds, people start to show strong preferences for early information by choosing find out now. So in short, the longer the delay between receiving early information and the actual outcome, the more people wanted to know about what that outcome was going to be by clicking find out now. Uh, individual variance was still large between different participants. However, many participants did show preferences similar to those seen in the average data. So starting off at indifference or low and then going higher with a delay of length. So summarizing these two tasks, on average, people in both tasks seek information regardless of the valence of that expected outcome. So whether it was winning or losing points, receiving a chocolate uh, that you could eat or a high pitched screeching sound, people wanted to know what the future held for them. Delay was also an important factor when primary rewards were used. They didn't appear to be very important when we use secondary rewards such as money, but this is the first to our knowledge, um, first direct comparison of these two reward types, so primary and secondary. And it also does support previous studies which showed an effective delay using primary rewards. We did not, however, find any evidence of temporal discounting at longer delay lengths. So for primary rewards, while preference did flatten as it reached 40 and 80 seconds, 
it did not show any signs of actually abating towards indifference. It did continue to climb and for both um, the chocolate and sound condition, 80 seconds was the highest preference we saw for find out now. Perhaps a delay in the form of minutes is necessary to exhibit such an effect if one were to exist. Overall, however, an uncertainty aversion account did give a better explanatory account of the data for the two experiments that we've run. This does not rule out that anticipation, say both savoring and dread, play an important role in people's information seeking. But in these two tasks here, it didn't seem to play any important role or one over and above um, what aversion to uncertainty had to play. So some future considerations. So recent research in the field, as well as our own preliminary studies, suggests the amount of uncertainty or probability of an event plays an important role in people's information search. For instance, people appear to show a stronger knowledge preference when a reward is 75% likely as opposed to 25. So if in our study, for example, there's a 75% chance of an M&M compared to a 25% chance of M&M, we find that people want to know more when it's a 75% chance as opposed to 25% chance. Another behavior which needs to be considered is deliberate ignorance in information search. So field studies and hypothetical questionnaires they find, people, uh, they find people avoid information about future events. Often when these are extremely aversive, like finding out about an inheritable disease, or when you're going to die, or when your partner's going to, uh, to die. To our knowledge, this sort of aversion to information has not been observed in the lab. Presumably this avoidance is due to fear dread of the possible outcomes. So it may be the case that in extreme circumstances, anticipation outweighs the role of uncertainty aversion in information search. However, this has not been found in any lab studies yet. Also, um, much work has already been done to develop computational models on these. So there's work from uh, multiple people developing models on non-instrumental information search. But it remains to be seen whether such a model can describe the full gamut of behaviours observed in both the lab and in the field. In addition, whether between subject variability can be accounted for by personal differences, such an aversion to uncertainty. So that does conclude the talk for today. Um, here's the contact for myself, Jake Embry, as well as Ben Newell, if any of you have any further questions or you'd like to talk about uh, the research that we talk about here or any research we're currently doing in this field, feel free to send uh, either myself or Ben an email. Um, thank you for tuning in today online and hopefully we'll see you all at some point. Thank you.